I got up at 5 o'clock this morning. I've spent all that time trying to calm myself down. And thanks to Mark Parkhurst, I'm wound up like an eight-day alarm clock. <laughs> he did a great job talking about mothers that fear the Lord. When you try to separate the idea of a mother that fears the Lord from a wife that fears the Lord, you got problems in the home. And I think we understand that. So in that sense, there is a real kinship between our two talks. And so in talking about a wife who fears the Lord, trying to think about the best way to go about that while covering the areas that the planners of this meeting have requested that I cover, I thought the quickest and most efficient way would be to just put a picture of my wife up here and talk about that for a few minutes and sit down. But since I'm a husband who fears the wife, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I just scared her to death, y'all. <laughs> We're going to talk about what the Bible says because that's our ultimate guide about a wife who fears the Lord. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. She'll be praised by her family. She will be praised by God's people. And she will be praised, most importantly, by God on the day of judgment. Well done, good and faithful servant because to be a wife that fears the Lord you've got to be good and you've got to be faithful never give up like what we've heard about already what are the primary responsibilities of a wife who fears the Lord well she's taught to love isn't she we heard about that brotherly friendship love that she has for her family from Titus 2 and verse 4 that not only teaches her to love her children but also says to love their husbands. That's what the older women are to teach the younger women to do, to love their husbands. Why would you want to teach that? Why would you need to teach that? Because we're not as easy to love as we think we are. That's why. And so these younger sisters need that older sister that says, Hey, girl, don't give up. I know he's a scumbag, but love him anyway, okay? And so you've got to tackle that job understanding what love does. Romans 13, verse 9 and 10, using a different Greek word to describe how love operates, he says, for the, for the commandment, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is a fulfillment of the law. When you love your husband like you should, instead of harming him, you'll do him good and not evil all the days of your life, as the Scriptures say. Another responsibility of the wife is submission. I know the idea of submission seems ugly to the world. That's because the world in its stubborn and sin-broken heart doesn't want to submit to God. And therefore, anything else that sounds or smells or feels like submission is going to be repugnant. But submission cries to us from the cross of Jesus Christ because in that sacrifice, He submitted to God's plan for our redemption. And what greater power is there in this world than the power that's had in Christ's submission to God's plan as he gave his life on the cross? Don't listen to the world's lies that says submission is weak, but understand the real power that throbs in the soul of submission. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the, as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Going to verse 33, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So submission is more than just doing what he says, but there's this idea of respect, a real sense of respect and honor that she has for her husband. As Mark said, we talked to 
different sisters in the church about her talks and received wisdom and encouragement from them. I talked to different sisters in the church that seemed to have strong and stable families and asked about encouragement. And here's some things that the sisters had to say for you, ladies, about the issue of submission. What are ways you show respect for your husband? Let me give you a hint. Making fun of him in public isn't one of them, okay? He may deserve it, okay? But that's not a way to show respect, is it? Number two, recognize that yielding to your husband equals yielding to God. And the reason that's true is because God asked you to yield to your husband. And so you've got to think about that when it's really getting difficult. And that's not because your husband is God. He's struggling too. He's got submitting he has to do as well. But it's because you're showing him what it's like to be a servant of Christ. Don't make a non-God issue a God issue to excuse rebellion against your husband's leadership. And in case it's not obvious to you what they mean by that, what they mean by that is don't tell yourself that a judgment matter where he's made a judgment decision that you don't like is really a cut and dried black and white matter of right and wrong so you got to rebel against him and go do what God says. Don't talk yourself into that. Don't use that as a cloak for a rebellious heart. The Bible tells us rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So if you've got that rebellious heart, hop off the broom, okay, and humble yourself before God and let the way you treat your husband follow. Service. The responsibility of a wife that fears the Lord is service. And I want to say, this is not just about serving the husband. This is about serving the children. Because when you serve your children, as Brother Mark has talked about, you are serving your husband. And every husband in this audience this morning that's got a lick of sense knows that. Okay? When you serve your children, you're serving your husband. Galatians 5.13 talks about the general idea of Christian service when he said, you brethren have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. When you love your husband and your children and the Lord the way you should, then that love will drive you to serve, will it not? That love will drive you to serve. That service is manifest in the domestic realm. You have domestic obligations and responsibilities. Proverbs 31 describes her well when he said in verse 13, she seeks wool and flax and willingly, willingly works with her hands. She's like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar she also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maid servants. This kind of service means she's a hard-working girl. And she's working hard for the benefit of her family. It is not a job for the lazy. The Bible says in Proverbs 31, verse 21, verse 27, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She needs time to rest. She needs time to decompress. Husbands, she needs a break from you and the kids. Put those together in one and go take them out somewhere and give her a break, but for the mother that, that is that wife that fears the Lord, she knows that's secondary. Her primary goal is her works of domestic service. Look at what he said about it in Titus 2, verse 4 and 5, talking about the older women that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, keepers at home is what the King James says, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God may be not blasphemed, when you take care of your domestic duties, you're helping advance the gospel of Christ. Because of your labors, your tireless, not eating the bread of idleness labors. Because of those tireless labors, those that might blaspheme the Lord and his cause and the gospel and the church 
might also refrain. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house. Give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Again, the idea of domestic service has to do with not bringing reproach on the church, but instead helping advance the gospel. Now, he says she's to manage the household, and I wanted to especially observe this passage because I want you to see it's more than just chores. It's a leadership role that requires leadership skill, and any kind of godly leadership is a work of service. And ladies, there's a reason that the Lord gave this leadership to you. I want to tell you a story. My brother Mike and I, we've always been close, together through thick and thin, good and bad, indifferent, and all points in between. And one day when our children were young, and Mike and Han had come to visit Tanya and, and me and the girls, Tanya and Han went off to shop or decompress or whatever, and we're like, yeah, we'll take care of the kids because we're good husbands. That's what we do. <clears throat> and Jonathan, Mike's son, was not yet potty trained. He's very little. And he soiled himself. It was bad. <laughs> the old factory damage was profound and far-reaching. Is that delicate enough? <laughs> And I looked at Mike and I said, I'm not sticking my hand in that. <laughs> and Mike said, yeah, I'm not either. But mama didn't raise no quitter. So I said, Mike, let's run some hot water in that tub. And we'll very carefully grab the edges of his garments and we'll yank those britches down and I'll take the ankles and you take the arms and we'll slosh him back to, back to and we did. We sloshed Jonathan back and forth in that tub. We didn't get a drop on us because we're problem solvers. And he squealed like a wounded wildcat. That'll advance the potty training. He'll think twice. Next time he'll wait till mama gets home. <laughs> we're helping potty train. Yeah, boy. When we were done cleaning him, we stood him up in the tub and said, all right, now, boy, just stand there and quit squalling or your mama's going to kill us. About that time, they come through the front door. What on earth did you do to my boy? To this day, we're defending what we did. We think it worked out great because we didn't get anything on us. There's a reason God didn't put men in charge of that kind of stuff. <laughs> Women have an attention to detail. You're gifted in that way. We try. We want to help. We have limitations. Listen to some of your sisters, some encouragement. Is it still a woman's job to keep the home? Nothing. Nothing the world says will change that. That's the will of God. And that's the standard by which homes and individuals will be judged before his throne. Is it wise to raise your daughter to make her career a priority? Just because she doesn't work outside the home doesn't mean she's not important. Do not forget that and do not underestimate the value of a woman who's so dedicated to her home. What you do matters. It is life-changing, family-changing, soul-changing, society-changing, church-changing. It matters. You are not just doing this for your family. You are doing this for the Lord. That's from your sisters. Drink that in. What about financial service? She can help financially with the home. The Bible says in Proverbs 31, select verses, she considers the field and buys it. From her profits, she plants a vineyard. 
She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and holds, and her hand holds the spindle. Skipping now to verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchant. She's bringing income into the family, isn't she? That's not wrong. But I want to encourage you to recognize as you study this virtuous wife that he tells us about here in Proverbs 31, she never does that to the, de to the detriment of her duties to the home. But that falls in together with the duties of her home. And because she does not eat the bread of idleness, because she works willingly with her hands, she can balance those duties, always giving priority to her family. She has character qualities such as being trustworthy. The heart of her husband safely trusts her so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. He doesn't just trust her, but he safely trusts her because he knows she is his friend and ally and she's going to do him good. And the good that she does him might sometimes sound a little bit like her telling him, hey, hon, you got a problem, you need to fix this. And she'll always do that with a sense of respect and from the heart of the love of Christ, but she'll gladly do it because she's doing him good. It's far-reaching how he can trust her and lean on her to tell him that his sermon was awful. Trust me, I know. She'll tell you the good news or the bad. And so she's honorable in that endeavor. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Verse 25, strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. The honor with which she conducts herself and her wifely affairs bleeds over into her husband's reputation. That is the power of submission and love and service. She has benevolent character. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. The same compassion that leads her to correct her children, that leads her to care for her children, that leads her to love and serve her husband and to be there for him in a multitude of ways, that same compassion reaches in the direction outside the home and brings honor to the home. She has a character quality of kind wisdom. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. That's Proverbs 31 and 26. Proverbs 21 and 9, better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than a house shared with a contentious woman. She's kind in the way she approaches her husband, even if she has to correct him rather than being contentious and angry. Look, I hear the coaching sometimes, often from the world and unfortunately, occasionally from a sister in Christ, teaching that woman, if you'll just do this and do that and be cranky and hard to get along with and this, this, and this, and then, you know, you'll be able to manipulate them and get more of what you want out of the marriage. It's a recipe for failure. Think about what he said in Proverbs 21 and 9. He's better off being lonely than having to deal with that. That's rough because loneliness runs deep. Being able to be surly and hard to get along with is not powerful. I know the world says that empowers you, but the real power comes in your ability to control that, control yourself, and act with dignified aplomb. Being a wife to an unbelieving husband. They asked me to talk a little bit about that and the challenge that that brings. Number one, don't destroy the marriage. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7 and 13, a woman who has a husband who does not believe if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Bottom line, put very simply, if the marriage is going to fall apart, don't you be the one that makes it fall apart. You don't be the reason. 
It may be destroyed. He may end it. There may be things that are beyond your control. At the end of the day, all you can control is the choices you make. And that's hard to understand and go with in a lot of different struggles in life. And certainly it is the case in this struggle. But just make sure you're doing all you can to make things work. Be godly. As he teaches in 1 Peter 3, verse 1 through 4, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. If you can't please him, just know that you're pleasing God. And so you keep trying by being that godly person. You just got to do all you can. It makes me think about Abigail. In 1 Samuel 25 and verse 3, we read about her husband. The name of the man was Nabal, the name of his wife, Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was of the house of Caleb. Nabal was a wicked man. In today's terms, he kind of compares to the unbeliever that a good woman is married to because Abigail was a godly woman. And how does their story unfold? Nabal had failed to help David as Moses' law obligated Israelites to help the poor when they had the means to do so. And David had helped Nabal and asked for food and reciprocation, and Nabal bitterly refused. In 1 Samuel 25, verse 23, Abigail saved her husband's life. David and his men were on their way to kill Nabal and all the household. It says, when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. So she fell at his feet and said, on me, my Lord, on me, let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. Please let my nor not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm from a Lord be as Nabal. And now this present, which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant. For the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days." It was Nabal's fault that household didn't feed and take care of David and his poverty and, and his friends there that were in such dire need. And she stepped up and righted that wrong and corrected that violation of Moses' law and took the guilt of it upon herself. And it's not because her husband deserved it. It wasn't because Nabal deserved that, to have that kind of wife. It's because God deserved to have that kind of servant. And let that be your motive. That never worked out. Nabal didn't turn his heart. It's one of those sad stories. But it wasn't because Abigail didn't do her best. Do all that you can. The challenges that confront our wives, one that I would like you to think about is pride. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. There are a lot of political and social movements today that are all about a woman trying to exalt herself. Let God do the exalting. You take care of the task that God has given you to do as a wife that fears the Lord, and he will exalt you way better than you or the world can. So tune out the ungodly voices of the world and let God do the exalting. And speaking of those ungodly voices, don't bend or break to the pressures of the world. Proverbs 4, 14, and 15. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. 
turn away from it and pass on. Did you see how he said it over and over and over? Avoid the path of the world. Look, I know a lot of those political and social voices promise that they care about you. But let's just peel back the curtain for a minute and have a gander at that old wizard. Those same voices do not care about a woman before she is born. They do not care about a woman while she is being born for they will give a standing ovation and cheer wildly at legislation that sanctions the merciless slaughter of that helpless woman until her last longest toe exits the birth canal. And if they don't care about you before you're born and while they're being born, make no mistake about it, they don't care about you after you're born. They seek the advancement of their own agenda and that agenda is not you and it's not your children and it's not your home. Anybody that has enough hate in their heart to do the things to unborn women that those people applaud to do do not care about you. Stop listening. Stop listening. If you want to know more about how to be empowered and how to get somewhere in life, then open God's book and feed on it and feed dutifully and prayerfully and obedient. Laziness. Proverbs 10, 26 says, As vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the lazy man to those who send him. It's really disappointing to dispatch someone to a job and find out they didn't do it, won't do it because they're lazy. And I'll tell you, there have been times, you think about all the different duties that this wife who fears the Lord has, you think about it, it just sounds impossible. Some of you, I've shared this story with you before about a woman I did a Bible study with probably about 35 years ago. And we were talking about the virtuous wife in Proverbs 31, our study kind of veered into that, and she wanted to talk about that, so we did. And she said, I'm telling you, David, that woman doesn't exist. And I answered her that day in a similar way to how I'm going to answer it right now. Yes, she does. I was raised by one. I married one. And together with God's help, she and I have raised two. And there's more on the way. Furthermore, I go to church with a whole slew of them. It's not impossible. You just don't want to do the work that's necessary to do it. She's there, and we do go to church with them. And I'm going to tell you how they get it done. It's the same way my wife gets it done. Because she stays up late, and she gets up early. And she works from can till can't, and she doesn't stop until it's done to her satisfaction. And if I try to go in and do it ahead of her so she won't have to, she'll come back and redo every bit of it. <laughs> if that's what has to be done. Baby, why don't you just go to bed? We've got company coming. I know, but the house looks like a magazine. It's not up to my standards. But dear, look at it. It looks great. It's a reflection on me. And I'll quit when I'm finished. You cannot be lazy and be that. Okay? I know you need a break. And husbands, I hope you're helping give them a break. Get in there and help them. Do it for them every once in a while. Just be ready for them to redo it all, okay? <laughs> oh, that hurts. Emotions. Proverbs 25, 28 says, Whoever, whosoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down and without walls. I talked earlier about that powerful woman is not the one who can pitch a fit. The powerful one is the one who can hold it back. And it may feel like a team of Clydesdales to you, but hold it back. You expect him to control his motions. You expect him to rule his spirit. You've got to rule yours. I know it's hard. And I know that even while us adorable husbands are trying with all our might to make it easy for you, we're just making it harder. 
but we're cute. So that ought to help a little. Contain those emotions. You're teaching your sons what to put up with someday. Pay attention to what your home life is like and control your emotions. How can the husband best support his wife? Appreciate her. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who causes shame is like rottenness in his bones. You want to know the value of a good woman? There's a lot of good ways to see that, but one way is find the guy that's ashamed of his wife who's destroying his home and see the yearnings of his heart and you'll see the value of a wife that fears the Lord. She's the crown of her husband. Guys, appreciate her. I remember years ago <clears throat> when Mike and I were little, our older brother was a good bit older than us, and so he, he was kind of on his way out of the home, and, and, and Dad was still talking to Mike and I, and he would, he would set us down and give us these lectures about how Mom stayed at home and just worked there on the place where we grew up, helped produce food, things like that. He would say, now, boys, your mom is worth a lot to me, and he would go through all these different things she did for the family, and he would talk about how much she was worth to, to the family just financially. It was kind of a, a lesson in economics. Good dads give a few of those. And he was talking to us. And after a while, we kind of figured out, hey, wait, this isn't just a lesson in economics. This is also a lesson in spirituality and home values. And years later, after we buried both of them, I woke up one day and, and I said, you know what? He wasn't just talking to us. He was talking to mama. And he was showing his appreciation. So that's a good thing, husbands, that we can do for our wives to encourage them. Praise her. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also. And he praises her. Listen to encouragement from your sisters. What are some ways your husband rises up and calls you blessed? Build a friendship with her. And all of these things speak to the lady about what kind of wife to be. Be the one that welcomes that friendship love. Be the one that gives them something worth praising. Don't make them hunt through the recesses of their mind to figure out something nice to say. Make it easy for them. Pray with her. I, you know, I didn't just hear this from the ladies we talked to about this study today, but across the years, preachers and elders hear this a lot from sisters in the church. We want our husbands to pray with us, to pray for us, and to lead us. Spiritually lead her. Be willing to call her out if she's not doing right, but do it in love and do it out of loyalty to the Lord, not out of selfish motives. Don't let her feel forgotten. Because there's something as powerful as being a wife and a mother is, as powerful as those things are, a lady in the midst of those labors can tend to feel forgotten and unimportant. Don't let her feel that. Don't lose heart. Other families aren't as perfect as the pictures make it seem. I know it may look ideal, but all families struggle. So don't lose heart. Serve her. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. So if it's good for her to be a loving servant, then out of love you serve her in that servant lordship. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. If you should die for her, then do the things that come short of dying for her but make her know you're serving her out of love. That will inspire her if she has a godly and right heart. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I want to close by looking at Paul's admonition there and all of its impact and assure you that a wife that fears the Lord is a standing gospel declaration of how the church follows Christ, of the self-sacrificing love of Christ. It points to her husband's self-sacrificing leadership. The good children such homes foster lay down a path and a pattern of behavior that points to Christ and his church. 
when Paul talked about the family right in the middle there in Ephesians 5, after talking about husbands and wives and just before talking about children, he said, hey, y'all, this is about Christ and the church. So it's not about you. It's not about the husband. It's about Christ and his church. And so be that wife that fears the Lord that screams that ongoing gospel message. And God bless you as you set out to do this very difficult job.